the Cambridge Neuroscience Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. This series features current work from neuroscientists across the schools and departments of the University of Cambridge, reflecting the pioneering work and diverse interests of our members here. Each seminar focuses on one of the new interdisciplinary themes of Cambridge Neuroscience. And for more info on the talks covered in this seminar series and all things neuro-related here at Cambridge, please follow us on Twitter at CamNeuro and follow the links below. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Alan Herbison from the Department of Physiology, Development and Neuroscience here at the University of Cambridge. Um, Alan has split his time over his academic career over in New Zealand and the UK. He actually did his PhD in the UK in the Babraham Institute and then faculty postdoc and faculty positions um, in New Zealand and then we were lucky enough to nab him back to uh, Cambridge just before the COVID pandemic. So it's really nice to actually have him here to speak at this seminar series and uh, for those of you who've kind of been tuned this has been a while coming so uh, we're really glad that you've all joined us today. Alan's research is very much linked to the hypothalamus and fertility, and that's what he's going to talk to us about today. So over to you, Alan. Okay, <clears throat> thanks uh, very much, Bevola. Thank you for that. So, um, and thank you to those of you who have tuned in on uh, yet another Zoom um, talk. Um, in person, things are better, but uh, I guess the Zoom still has room uh, in our community. So. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, hypothalamic control of, of episode generators um, in relation to fertility. So, hold on, there we go. Um, so people are usually really pretty surprised uh, when I tell them that the brain is actually in control of fertility. Uh, you know, most people think that the gonads and the ovaries sit there are, are pretty autonomous, sort of whirring away and... Uh, and I think that Woody Allen got it right when he, he famously uh, quipped that, uh, you know, the brain was his second favorite sex organ. And, and indeed, uh, you know, the gonads can't do it by themselves because in many instances, they really need to know what's going on uh, in that individual person or in the environment around them. So, for example, puberty is something that depends very much on your internal state and your environmental conditions, um, as is... Uh, a woman becoming pregnant needs to make sure that uh, you know the situation both internally and externally is correct and so of course the only way that you can uh, integrate all that information uh, is through the brain uh, the second thing that the brain does and and you know got this little schematics up here um, showing that the the hormone secretion in the blood is pulsatile there's a male, it's just pulse style, it goes on uh, pretty much forever. And so, of course, you know, the brain is, is perfectly uh, generate, uh, perfect for making episode generators uh, to generate this sort of thing. And, and here's the female down the bottom uh, with these episodes of pulses. But then uh, every mid-cycle, you have this massive um, LH surge that causes um, ovulation, so a different form of activity. So you need the brain to, to really mold and, uh, and generate all these different types of activity. So this is uh, in the middle here. This is your, you know, classic textbook uh, version of the hypothalamo uh, pituitary gonadal axis, and you know the key cell here is the GnRH neuron, gonadotrophin releasing hormone neuron, uh, and these cells project down to the median eminence. They release GnRH into the portal system, and they stimulate the gonadotrophs to release LH and FSH in this this episodic pulsatile fashion, or in females uh, in this. Um, LH surge type of pattern of activity. So these generation neurons are key uh, and central in the whole mechanism. Um, but I think it's worth uh, for this talk just to mention some really pretty unusual um, properties of these cells, because I think it's relevant to what we'll talk about later on. Uh, the first thing is, is really quite remarkably is that the GnRH neuron is not born in the brain. Uh, these cells are actually born out in the nose from ectodermal and uh, neural crest origins in the vulnerable nasal organ. And then uh, during development, they actually migrate uh, into the brain. Uh, and they do that by hitching a ride on the uh, olfactory uh, receptor uh, on the axons here of these olfactory receptor neurons. 
And the Generations say quite literally uh, use this as a form of axophilic migration to get themselves into the brain. Um, having got there, uh, they then send their projections down to uh, what will be uh, the median eminence. So this is a, a very curious, uh, unusual, and even dangerous strategy. You know, the 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 a species depends on having uh, fertility and reproduction, and so that's rather unusual uh, that this situation should occur. Another uh, result of this unusual migration is that when we go to look at GnRH neurons, and this is a a sagittal section that's taken through a mouse brain, but it could be through any mammalian brain, is that you can see the remnants of this migration pathway uh, running through here. So here is where the GnRH neurons were migrating, and then uh, at really quite in a random way, so you can see they just stop in a very scattered uh, distribution through all of this area. And then they project off their axons or, or their projections, as we thought, um, down here, way down here to the median eminence. So we have a very, uh, very scattered distribution, which was really a, really a disaster uh, for us as neuroscientists until we had genetic strategies that allowed us to uh, get in and identify these cells. Um, these cells have a very, very unusual morphology. Uh, so here's a couple of cells that, be, that have been reconstructed from uh, in situ um, labeling. And so they're, they're classically bipolar. Here's the cell body, and they have two dendrites that go off at 180 degrees. And here's your, your one moving this way here. And then the other one starts off, then sort of realizes it's going the wrong way and does this hairpin turn and comes and, and follows the other one down. Here's another generation you're on with its bipolar dendrites, uh, one going off this way, the other one going and taking a bit longer to realize it's on the wrong route and then turning and, and coming back down. So these neurons have a really quite spectacular dendritic um, morphology, very simple, uh, two dendrites, 180 degrees, and often um, turning around. So when we were doing this work, we were always uh, a bit concerned that we couldn't find the axon, which of course was the thing that you know, connects these generation neurons to the median eminence uh, and such like. And it wasn't until Michel Hurd, who was a PhD student in the lab, um, had a preparation going where we had some of the more caudal GnRH neurons uh, in the same preparation as the median eminence. So we thought, well, now we'll be able to find the axon of these cells. And to our horror, it turned out that these dendrites uh, were actually running all the way down into the median eminence before they then broke up here into what would be considered uh, axons. And these axons uh, terminated near blood vessels so they could release the GnRH into the, into the bloodstream. So this was um, uh, pretty uh, striking um, and, and unusual. Um, these uh, dendrites, they, they look like dendrites. They, they have um, spines all over them. Um, Alicia Moore even did some electron microscopy work uh, down in this area here just to really confirm this. And in fact, these uh, processes here are just covered in synaptic uh, inputs. In fact, the density of synaptic inputs onto a GnRH neuron is highest here uh, than it is even around the cell body in these proximal dendrites. So we had this unusual uh, situation. Um, Carl Eimunger in the lab, uh, again, if we could get cells that are relatively close to the median eminence, could patch a cell here. And we could uh, manipulate it here by putting uh, puffs of GABA on it. Um, these generation neurons maintain an immature chloride homeostasis throughout life, so GABA's um, uh, depolarizing. And we could optogenetically activate GABA onto these cells and, and generate um, currents. So it certainly looked like we had this zone uh, down here that um, was clearly carrying action potentials because we knew action potentials came up from our, the cell body down at the median eminence, but was also receiving a lot of synaptic input. And so we coined the term for this a dendron because it had both um, shared properties of a dendrite uh, and an axon. And uh, to my knowledge, at least this type of structure hasn't been reported as yet uh, in any other place in the, in the mammalian forebrain. So uh, just to expand and summarize on that a little bit more, that this is, this is how we look upon um, GnRH neurons with this unusual um, morphology. They have these um, dendrites that bend back and go back into the median eminence. Um, we know that uh, they receive synaptic uh, inputs, of course, onto their dendrites. We know from a lot of studies 
the action potentials are initiated here. It's typically about 80 to 100 micrometers up on the dendrite that's uh, leading away um, from the median eminence. So it's interesting to think you initiate action potentials here and actually you get uh, the double, a double whammy, you get action potentials running down here and here. It's like a double shot going, um, going into the median eminence. So, and, and then we have this area here where we have a very high synaptic density. So it's a very strange morphology, and it might, of course, um, be related to their, their strange um, development. But functionally, we'd like to know, you know, what is the, the relevance of this? And so one advantage, at least, of having these cell bodies, you know, many thousands of micrometers away, actually, from the, this point here, is that we thought we could probably address that um, in vivo. And so uh, we turn to these. These are studies done with Li Wang uh, and her colleagues in Shanghai. And essentially, we just turn to a chemogenetic strategy and we put uh, HM4DI, the inhibitory dread, we put that into all the generation neurons that are projecting down to this median eminence. And then we went in with um, injections in vivo of CNO uh, into this area down here. So we're, we're trying to inhibit activity of the dendron, but of course, also uh, all the median eminence axon terminals and everything. So we can't distinguish those. So if we do that, we then wanted to look at those two forms of LH secretion I was telling you about, the LH surge and the LH pulses. And so if we do that, uh, this is a representation of the LH surge and various controls. And here is when you put in CNO and you just completely abolish the surge. Here's uh, just a, an individual example of LH pulses that you see when you infuse saline into this area. And you can see a massive difference when we actually inhibit uh, activity with CNO. There are still some little pulses here, but the, the uh, level is hugely reduced. So I don't guess that that's really too surprising. I mean, essentially, we're inhibiting, uh, you know, the business end of the GnRH neurons, and so we, we mess up their surges and, and their pulses. More telling uh, was when we did the same thing, but now instead of inhibiting that area, we inhibited up here. So we did large injections where we're trying to inhibit lots of the GnRH neuron um, cell bodies and, and process, um, dendrites up in this area here. And if we do that, then again, the LH surge is completely abolished. But quite remarkably, uh, pulsatile LH secretion, here's the saline, here's the CNO, actually was not changed uh, in, in any way at all. So this is a pretty confronting um, result because it, it's saying that uh, the GnRH cell bodies and where we know action potentials are generated is actually not apparently required for this pulsatile secretion to occur. Uh, and indeed, uh, as challenging as that was, we went on and actually repeated that study using uh, inhibitory optogenetics and got exactly the same result. So that uh, that and, and other work by other laboratories has led to this, this view of how the GnRH neurons operate. So, so the GnRH neurons are essentially um, a motor neuron that are, are good at, at making GnRH peptide. And then we have two different episode generators. So we have um, a surge generator, which seems to be operating here in a sort of classical way on the, on the proximal dendrites and cell bodies to generate the surge. And then we have a pulse generator which is actually operating in this, this unusual area here down on the dendron. And it's this pulse generator that's generating um, all of these uh, little pulses. So that was, uh, that's, that was a view of it. Uh, and, and probably the biggest thing that's, that's happened in our field was these two papers in 2003, uh, one from Nicolas Deroux in Paris, uh, and the other one from Harvard and Cambridge, where uh, Bill College in, in physiology had a, a lead role. And what these papers did was they um, identified GPR54 as a critical uh, receptor for uh, in humans, and in this case also for mice to go through puberty. So GPR54 is the receptor for a molecule called kisspeptin, which actually really is named after the Hershey um, chocolate kiss. And kisspeptin um, in these individuals uh, are perfectly normal, except for the fact that they don't go through puberty. So this, this had a huge impact on our field, and I would really hate to think where we would be now uh, if this hadn't happened. I mean, this was obviously a clinical observation. 
from our perspective, came out of nowhere. We would never have been looking for cispeptin because until this time, it was considered a, a, a molecule in uh, cancer biology. But nevertheless, it, it came along, thankfully, and gave us a, point in, a pointer to how important cispeptin is. And indeed, cispeptin is absolutely essential for most things that the GN ration does. So in terms of pulsatility here, I, I show you a picture. This is a human male. This is a 24-hour recording showing these pulses of LH that are occurring. And here's what it looks like uh, in an individual with a mutation of that GPR54. So it's completely absent. This can be uh, recapitulated uh, perfectly in mice. So here's a is a wild type male mouse showing its LH pulses over a shorter period of time. And this is what the knockout, GPR54 knockout looks like. It's completely flat. So a few years ago, we, we re-engineered that mouse so that we reintroduced uh, the, the GPR54, the cispeptin receptor. We put it back uh, into the mouse, but put it back so it was only inside the GnRH neuron. So essentially we rescued uh, cispeptin signaling in the GnRH neuron. Uh, and when you do that, pulsatile secretion uh, comes back completely normally. So cispeptin is essential for this uh, pulsatile pattern of LH secretion. Mm. And I just want to, uh, you know, wind forward now eight or nine years and really give you um, where we are at the moment in terms of thinking uh, about these, uh, the cispeptin and, and the pulse generator. So it turns out that the cispeptin required for pulses um, lives in this population of neurons in the arcuate nucleus, uh, which are also called um, kindy neurons. And that's, uh, we call them that just to recognize the fact that in addition to being a glutamatergic uh, phenotype, these cells make multiple different neuropeptides, uh, including cispeptin, neurokinin B and dynorphin, which is where the K and D, Y, kindy uh, acronym comes from. This is a this is a, a nice picture of RNA scope of a single neuron from Alicia Moore, just saying uh, mRNAs for all of those three. So these these three neuropeptides are very highly expressed in essentially uh, all of these uh, cispeptin neurons. So these neurons uh, live here. Uh, in fact, the only place they project to uh, is down here. This this here gives you a better anatomical view of it. Here are green are our cispeptin neurons in the arcuate nucleus. And here are these uh, GnRH dendrons that I was talking about coming in here uh, before they split into axons within the median eminence. So these neurons here don't project up to the GnRH cell bodies. They just project um, down through here into this, this area here. And I'm not uh, going to have time to go into um, this part of, of the signaling, but just to tell you that uh, we've done quite a lot of work. Um, Xiao Yeo has done a lot of expansion microscopy. Um, so I has done a lot of work um, looking in confocal, in vitro um, brain slices. And the bottom line is essentially that uh, the cispeptin neurons uh, wind their fibers through here where they operate with volume transmission. So they don't make synapses. Um, they Each cispeptin neuron seems to wind by multiple uh, different GnRH neurons, and they essentially, you can imagine them puffing cispeptin out into the vicinity of this whole dendron. Uh, a sort of a side issue, but interesting point is that even though uh, there are all these different neuropeptides down here, the only thing that the GnRH dendron is listening to is GPR54. They don't have receptors for any of these other um, transmitters. So indeed, th this actually is this key location uh, where cispeptin is signaling that was identified in those, those clinical studies. The other part of it, and the one that I spend, want to spend a little bit more time on, is, is this part here, where <clears throat> we believe that this population of cispeptin neurons, there's probably about 2,000 of them or so, is really a, an autonomous um, central pattern generator in the brain. So we think it's able to generate its own uh, patterns of episodic activity, which is sort of indicated by these little... Um, these little bar things around here. And so I want to spend a bit of time um, going over the evidence for that and then extend that to some of the questions that we're faced with and that we're looking at at the moment. So <clears throat> to analyze the activity of these cells uh, in vivo, um, Sue Han in the lab pioneered this uh, approach of using GCAMP fiber photometry to record the activity of this cispeptin population. 
So here's just uh, an image here. There's our cispeptin neurons. They've got GCAMP in them, the calcium indicator. And then we put an optic fiber down to sit on top uh, of these cells. And when we do that, we see these really, really quite amazing recordings where you have a, a very low baseline activity. And then suddenly you have this sudden episode of activity, which tells us that this population of neurons is suddenly very active. Uh, if you blow it up, um, this activity lasts for about, you know, about a minute, 60 to 90 seconds. And then we have nothing. And then we have another event. So this is really perfectly uh, what you need in terms of an episode generator, in terms of a, a neural uh, construct for that. And indeed, uh, we can take these animals and while we do the recording, we can take tail tip blood samples from them uh, and measure LH, uh, one of those hormones that's released in a pulsatile fashion. And you can see that there's a very, very strong, well, and that in fact, there's a perfect correlation between pulse generator activity uh, and when you see uh, a pulse of LH uh, occurring usually about uh, four minutes afterwards. And, and we've done this in males, females, all sorts of different states. And there is a, there is a perfect correlation between these episodes of kisspeptin neuron activity uh, and uh, generation of pulses. So that's great in, in terms of looking at the population. But as I said, there's about 2,000 neurons there. And it would be really nice um, to look at these cells individually. Uh, in vivo. And so again, um, Sue has, has worked and pioneered this using a grin lens. So we use the UCLL miniscope system. And this essentially allows us to look at the activity of multiple cispeptin neurons simultaneously as the mice are going about um, doing the business in the cage. And, and here's a recording from one grin lens recording that Sue's made. And there's 27 cells here. And you can see the, these remarkable periods of synchronization when uh, all of these neurons are uh, individually active. And of course, this is what generates this, um, this population signal that we record here. It's uh, not all the case. I've you know, I blow, blown up here some examples. Here's cell 12 that doesn't respond. Not all cells are doing it. But it's probably something like 85% of those 2,000 kisspeptin neurons are so simultaneously synchronizing, which is pretty remarkable, I think, degree of, of homogeneity in the system. So if, uh, if that is the case, and uh, we should be able to manipulate these cispeptin neurons uh, to, to show if they're essential and sufficient uh, for pulses. And, and the first obvious thing to do, of course, was to go in with optogenetics and, and activate these cells. If we know that they're normally active for about a minute, what happens if we artificially activate them? Well, in fact, you get an incredibly robust, uh, reliable LH pulses. So here, for example, here's three... Uh, times of one minute, 10 hertz activation of cispeptin neurons. And here's the LH, and you can see it's very robust. Here, uh, for example, this shows you an LH pulse that's stimulated by optogenetics. And in red, it shows you the profile of an endogenous pulse. So it's really uh, near perfect. So certainly we can tick off that uh, these neurons are sufficient to generate pulsatility. Perhaps the more pressing question is, is that of whether you really need these cells or not. And so for this, uh, we did a lot of uh, optogenetic inhibition uh, experiments, and we used both archaeorhodopsin and halorhodopsin. And in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to show the halorhodopsin because um, they do give us um, a little bit of extra and very important information. So this work was done by uh, Richard Piet, who's the electrophysiologist, and Jenny Clarkson did the in vivo studies. So uh, a, an interesting thing about halorhodopsin, uh, when you do, and this is brain slice work here, where Richard's recorded the activity because of neurons, and you know shone uh, light on them, and indeed uh, they reduce their activity uh, quite nicely. But cispeptin neurons, like some other neural neurons um, that have halorhodopsin in them, actually show this rebound pattern of activity. So the moment you turn the light off, the cells then become uh, show rebound activation. And, and for most people, I guess this sort of ruins their, their halorhodopsin uh, optogenetic studies. But for us, actually, this is actually very, very useful because it means that we get a, a sort of double benefit from this. So not only do we inhibit our cells, we then, having inhibited them, then synchronously activate them all. And this allowed us to look at what happens if we reset activity. So here's the, uh, here's the experiment. So bilateral uh, 
uh, up to genetics, onto the kisspeptin neurons while we take blood samples. <clears throat> so here are, uh, here are two individual mice that, that uh, Jenny made recordings from. Here are your LH pulses. Here's when the light is on. Absolutely nothing until you turn the light off. And then with that rebound, actually it's enough to generate a pulse uh, of LH. Here's another animal here. Rebound initiates the LH pulse. And immediately after that, another pulse. This, this resetting of the pulse interval here is actually so robust. You can take your individual animals, and this is eight in this case, and you can mean all their activity. So these pulses, of course, are occurring at individual times. And so you end up just with a, a, a fairly random flat line. Here's where you have the optogenic inhibition. Here's where you turn off, you get a pulse. And in every single animal, you get another pulse uh, very reliably around this time point here. So this is this is uh, very um, useful for us because not only does it tell us that the kisspeptin neurons are actually um, necessary for this whole uh, LH pulses to occur, but it says that you can reset the activity by just resetting the kisspeptin neurons. And that uh, tends to support the idea that these are a, is an autonomous um, central pattern generator. So uh, here's, a, here's our little picture here. So we've got, I think, reasonably good evidence that these guys are the pulse generator uh, that's driving uh, this dendron here to release pulsatile um, release of GnRH. One of the key questions and one of the things that we're very actively interested in the moment is, is trying to understand actually how these cells operate. And, and in a very loose <laughs> manner, I've I've shown, shown here these recurrent collaterals. So we believe these cells have recurrent uh, collateral innovation uh, of each other. And the, the question is, how uh, does that actually operate? So as I said, uh, uh, these neurons have many different uh, neurotransmitters. And so <clears throat> you can do uh, electrophysiology, you, uh, cell attached electrophysiology here, and just look at what sort of receptors are functional and what they're doing to these cells. Uh, and so here's a cell that's, that kisspeptin has been put on, and, and kisspeptin, surprisingly, perhaps at the time at least, has no effect on these cells. Uh, dynorphin is quite potently inhibitory. Uh, neurokinin B is quite potently um, excitatory. So, <clears throat> and, and of course, I didn't show it here, but of course these cells are activated by gluta with uh, NMDA and, and as well as NMDA receptors. So we have uh, quite a mixture of, of different things to play with. One of the huge problems in, in trying to really look at the synchronization was that um, we were unable to have any in vitro model of it that allowed us to really effectively manipulate activity. And, and what happened was that if you made a brain slice and you looked at kisspeptin neurons, this is the pattern of activity that you saw. Just actually silent or rather slow, very erratic behavior, this, this cell was actually activated uh, before dynorphin was put on. And this really, uh, you know, didn't allow us to, to look at these things. So uh, when Paul Morris um, joined the lab, uh, one of the things that he said about doing was try to establish a brain slice preparation in which we had um, burst firing and synchronized burst firing of these kisspeptin neurons. And, and indeed, he was able to achieve that. So here we're using a kisspeptin GCAMP um, system. So we're using um, GCAMP in our kisspeptin neurons so we can image multiple cells uh, simultaneously. And so here are recordings from 11 kisspeptin neurons. And you can see that there are these times we indicate them, we call them as miniature synchronization events. So you can see there's these times when actually cells are actually showing these, this episodic activity and it seems to be synchronized. So if you look at cell five and six, these cells are, are pretty much running along quite nicely together. Uh, other cells are doing their own independent thing, but sometimes contributing. And so we have this, this pattern of, of uh, what we think is very, what we call loosely coupled uh, network activity, where individual cells are uh, sometimes joining and sometimes not joining uh, each other. And Paul's done uh, many other experiments on this that I, I don't have time to go into. These uh, calcium events actually represent episodic burst firing. So here is a, is a cell where, where Paul's made the calcium recording at the same time with the whole cell recording. And you can see this burst activity. And here's what happens to a slice when you put on TTH block sodium uh, 
voltage gated sodium channels. So indeed, we have this preparation uh, where we have uh, cispeptin neurons exhibiting this burst activity, and they're loosely um, synchronizing with each other. So what's the, the key neurotransmitter behind this? And it turns out uh, that it's actually glutamatergic signaling. So uh, here's a recording with these events that you can see are nicely synchronized. And here's the AMPA and NMDA receptor antagonists put on. And I, I think you can appreciate there's a very substantial reduction in the synchronized activity. And, and here's the mean data here. And in fact, uh, Paul can achieve this with CNQX alone. So we think that AMPA receptor signaling is, is absolutely essential uh, for, for this um, loose synchronization uh, that we see amongst these neurons. So this uh, was a very important pointer for us as to you know, what might be uh, essential uh, for these cells to synchronize, but ultimately uh, we have to bring this back uh, to the in vivo situation. And so uh, again, um, Sue uh, Han came in uh, and started this work. So what we were doing was the GCAMP uh, fiber photometry that I showed you before, but we all now had um, optic fibers that incorporated a, a small infusion cannula. And essentially what that means is that uh, we can infuse into the vicinity of the area we're recording. Uh, we can infuse in uh, whatever we like when we make the recordings. And that, and that actually uh, is not perhaps as easy as it might sound. And it's a little bit frightening to be infusing fluid into an area that you're actively uh, recording from uh, because these neurons are like all neurons sensitive. But we do have a, a, a protocol that Sue's established where basically for 10 minutes we infuse into the brain and we look at what happens. So if you do that uh, and you do this is in a gonadectomized male mouse so it's showing these uh, regular episodes, if you do that then most of the time that you uh, infuse the vehicle and a uh, synchronization event occurs. So Sue then uh, changed uh, and now infused in CNQX and APV and what she found was that the great majority of the time there were no events that occurred um, during this period of time. And so this is a typical type of, of recording. So indeed, this very much reflected the work that Paul was showing, uh, telling us that glutamate signaling is really important for these synchronization events to occur. So what about neurokinin B, one of those um, co-transmitters that I was talking about? Well, uh, if Sue infused in here a cocktail of antagonists actually against all tachykinin receptors, uh, you can see that the synchronization events still occurred. In fact, they occurred just like they did in, in vehicles. Uh, but what happened was that the amplitude here was reduced uh, approximately, uh, actually on average when we looked at all the animals, the amplitude of these events occurred, but it was reduced by about 20%. So our current thinking uh, then is that the synchronization events in these cells uh, result from uh, what would be considered emergent AMPA-based um, network synchronization. So in this example of six cells, we have cells that are, that are showing episodic burst firing. Uh, they're sometimes coupling up and, and through a sort of a near random or stochastic emergent uh, process, they get to a point where sometimes uh, you get many cells all lined up, uh, all synchronized. And, and as they get more synchronized, then it provides more impetus for more cells to become synchronized. So it's like a, an exponential uh, type mechanism that generates, uh, that brings many cells together. When these cells get, get together and they're firing faster, then of course we start getting neurokinin B release, which is, which is the classical frequency dependent release of NKB. So, you know, classically, um, modulating the glutamate release, and that this NKB then uh, creates the full synchronization, just bringing it together uh, and adding that extra 20% uh, on top of the synchronization. So this is work in progress, and this is this, these are our thoughts on that. Um, the <clears throat> I haven't spoken here about dynorphin, uh, which we're continuing to work on, but dynorphin uh, seems to be uh, very much involved in, in determining the interval between these synchronizations rather than the actual synchronization event itself. One of the most uh, striking inputs to this cuspeptin neuron uh, population, this pulse generator, uh, is that of um, feedback uh, of estrogen. So uh, 
in our classical situation here where we have the ovary uh, secreting estrogen, this is used as a feedback signal to basically tell the pituitary and the GnRH neurons what is the, ov what is the state of, of ovarian function. And this estrogen negative feedback is really huge. It's the most, it's the most powerful uh, sculptor of, of pulse generator activity uh, that we know by far. And this is just to give you an idea of how important this is. Here's a, a, a LH recordings from a mouse. So here's pulsatile LH secretion, just these two little blips here when the mouse is intact. And then the same mouse when it's overectomized, so the ovaries are taken out and the negative feedback's taken away, you can see LH secretion is vastly different. And that's the same in all, in all mammals. Here is a human uh, work from a human. Here's pulsatile LH secretion in the follicular phase in an intact female. And here's a, a postmenopausal woman, a different woman. And you can just see the magnitude of difference. So estrogen is, has a huge effect on sculpting, sculpting the activity of the pulse generator. So we were, uh, <clears throat> when you know that the, the arcuate cuspeptin neurons are the pulse generator, and then you find out uh, that these cells have ESR1 or estrogen receptor alpha, then it, it's a, a fairly a safe hypothesis, I guess, that estrogen, recept estrogen is acting directly on these cuspeptin neurons to, to um, sculpt this activity. And indeed, that is the case. So these are recordings made by Jamie uh, McQuillan. So again, we're back to photometry. Uh, here's your typical pattern here of these uh, episodes. Uh, they look rather small, but it's just because I've tried to keep the, um, the, the y-axis scale the same for all of these. And here, after this animal has been overectomized, you can follow the activity of the pulse generator over, these, over this time. And, and I think you can pretty clearly see that uh, the activity of the pulse generator is vastly different. We have events happening more frequently. Uh, the events are very unstable. They start, they seem to be unable to stop. They're starting and stopping. They're lasting for a long period of time. <clears throat> and of course, the amplitude is quite vastly reduced. Um, of course, when you over you take away many things, but this really is estrogen because if you give estrogen, and this is to the same animal, you give estrogen back, uh, three, seven days later, you can see you return it completely to normal. So estrogen is having a really, really powerful effect in, in sculpting the, the, the shaping, the activity of this pulse generator. So we wanted to really just um, nail down that it was estrogen receptors and cuspeptin neurons. And, and of course, there are many ways of doing that. Uh, one, of course, would be to the, just do the classic, you know, we could cross cuspeptin mice onto an estrogen receptor alpha flox mouse. But that has a number of issues and that you end up taking out estrogen receptors from all cuspeptin neurons in the body, not just the, the arcuate ones. And we end up with that really thorny problem uh, of developmental compensation. So what you really want to do is to be able to take the estrogen receptors out of the cuspeptin neurons and just the arcuate cuspeptin neurons and just uh, during adulthood. And so that can be achieved um, with its own caveats, but that can be achieved using uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to do in vivo um, gene editing. Uh, and so this is a, it's, it's reasonably complicated um, type of a platform, but essentially what you do is you set up a mouse uh, where you end up with um, Cas9, the endonuclease, only expressed in cuspeptin neurons. And then you infuse into the arcuate um, AAVs uh, containing the guide RNAs that you need. In this case, um, guide RNA um, uh, against the East ESR1, Eastern receptor alpha. So you then end up with all of the arcuate neurons are expressing the guide RNA, but of course the only neurons that have both the Cas9 and the guide RNA are the cispeptin uh, neurons themselves. And so uh, this methodology, of course, uh, will never knock out the gene, and you can only ever ask uh, expect for a, a knockdown. But indeed, uh, that does work. And here's some pictures. I think it's probably easier to look at these magenta ones here. Uh, so here is a, an animal with, uh, that's had nothing done. The, the purple is the estrogen receptors, and the green is the cuspeptin. And uh, when they have estrogen receptor, they have a white nucleus. <laughs> so I put a little asterisk in that just to emphasize that. But essentially, 90 to 95% of cuspeptin neurons have estrogen receptors. If you... Um, use the guide RNA system and actually try and uh, remove that, then in fact, that you vastly remove this. And here's the data here. So here, normally you have around about 90%. 
that's around 20%. So you can achieve, you know, nearly an 80% uh, knockdown in estrogen receptor expression and kisspeptin neurons. And here's a control uh, with using guide RNAs against LAC-Z, which is not targeting any, any uh, mammalian, mammalian um, gene. And again, oh, it's essentially, it's, it's normal. So this uh, does work. There are many controls and, and there's quite a vast amount of in vitro work involved and before you uh, get this up and going. But an important one is here to look at dopamine neurons. So these neurons are living, are living um, just around the kisspeptin neurons in the arcuate nucleus. Uh, and you can see that there's no effect uh, of this guide RNA as, as we would expect. <clears throat> so, so this uh, methodology allows us to be very selective in, in the cells that we're interested in and also do things uh, just in adulthood. So if we go back to our photometry and we now combine the CRISPR with the photometry and you, know, you can call it CRISPTometry and try and invent a new word. What we're doing here is we set up that animal for uh, CRISPR gene editing, but we also have a... Um, uh, have it set up for photometry. So we're able to record the population activity of our kisspeptin neurons, but we also have that infusion cannula. So that means that we can then infuse down the AAV with the guide RNA, uh, essentially uh, whenever we want to. So here are a couple of neurons, uh, a couple of, of animals, I should say. Uh, here's their synchronization activity. This is before we've done anything to them. They've just been uh, set up. And then what we do is we infuse in this animal here, we infused guide RNA3, and this animal here, we infused um, the guide RNA against LACZ. And you can basically sit in real time and watch what happens. And three weeks later, uh, this is what you see. So we've reverted this pattern of activity here right back to this. This is just to remind you of what it looks like in a normal overectomized animal, back to this pattern of highly unstable, uh, frequent high amplitude events, just exactly uh, as you would see if you just took estrogen away from a whole animal. Essentially, we've overectomized just the kisspeptin neuron. And here's the LACZ, <clears throat> where of course we don't uh, see anything much happening. So I think uh, together that those studies um, suggest that actually um, the pathway by which estrogen is able to um, suppress and keep pulse generator activity in check is clearly through estrogen receptor alpha uh, in these kisspeptin neurons. And we're now uh, very interested in trying to understand what is the program of genes being regulated by ESR1 uh, in these kisspeptin neurons um, to achieve that, that effect. So just to, to summarize then um, a bit about the neurobiology of, of called neuroendocrine fertility. Here, of course, is your textbook uh, view of it. And here is something uh, perhaps a, a layer deeper than that. Uh, there are a few, I think, really interesting points. Uh, one is this, this migration of the GNR neurons from the nose into the brain, which is uh, really uh, quite remarkable and I think actually is responsible for some of the strange features of these cells. I've shown you the, the unusual morphology of these cells, of these uh, projections coming down here, this, this dendron uh, uh, operating here that leads us to the system where we end up with, we can end up with two independent separate um, episode generators, a surge generator here that I haven't spoken about uh, and a pulse generator operating down here. And in fact, I think this, this pattern of, of episode generation in the brain is, is again, um, I think probably unique and, and something that I haven't uh, at least myself seen elsewhere. So <clears throat> just to acknowledge that uh, many of the, uh, much of this work was started at the University of Otago, where I was um, pre-COVID. Uh, this is the team uh, in, in Cambridge. Uh, and I think I've, I've mentioned uh, where I have the people that have been involved um, directly in, this, in these parts of the project. So I'm, I'm very happy to take questions and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alan, for a great talk. Fascinating work from you and your group. Join us next time when we welcome Dr. Kate Baker. Kate is the program leader track at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at the University of Cambridge, where she leads the Genomic Disorders and Cognitive Development Program. She's also an honorary consultant in the Clinical Genetics Group at the Cambridge University Hospital and an affiliate PI of the Academic Department of Medical Genetics. She'll be speaking to us on developmental disorders of presynaptic vesicle cycling, synaptotagmin 1 and beyond. Don't miss it. 
For more info on the talks covered here in this seminar series and all things neuro related in Cambridge, please follow us on Twitter at Cam Neuro and follow the links below. See you next time.